Welcome everybody to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette and we're so glad you're with us today to stay curious with this NASA legend, Mr. Jay Honeycutt. Hello, sir. You don't like me calling you a legend, but you are. Or Mr. <laughs> yeah, I'm calling Mr. Honeycutt, he says there. And uh, But uh, we are enjoying another conversation with Mr. Honeycutt. He was in some of our early days of Marty Winkle and I are my co-producer here behind the board uh, doing our Stay Curious program. We love how you support this and the American Space Museum, Jay. And uh, he wanted to offer to us a look at his career in the 1960s as a manager of the simulations at Johnson Space Center. And in October, we did a part one. We had a computer error and it, it uh, kind of bombed out on us, but there's plenty of great information there. In fact, he had almost 200 people watching that program, Jay. and. Uh, so we're going to continue about bonding the astronauts at Johnson Space Center flight control with the, the flight controllers there during the Apollo era. And uh, Jay, 51 years ago, the last Apollo moon mission was about a third of the way to the moon, Apollo 17. Have you thought about that? Seems like only yesterday. Yeah, I hear you there. Uh, well, I got to give you a little bit of background about Mr. Honeycutt. He'll have to endure this here. Uh, born in Jenna, Louisiana. I keep asking you where the best gumbo is here on the Space Coast. I don't think there is any. Anywhere in southwest Louisiana. Yep, there you go. <laughs> Unless your wife makes it there. But uh, Mr. Honeycutt has spent more than 40 years with NASA about that, beginning in the early days at the Redstone Arsenal in Huntsville, Alabama. And then he started contributing to the Apollo program as a flight simulations manager, uh, tutored uh, under... Uh, his and many people's role model, Mr. Chris Kraft. And you talked a little bit about him on our part one, uh, which you can see on YouTube. Uh, of course, Mr. Honeycutt's best remembered as the director of Kennedy Space Center from 1995 to 97, but he's much more than that, as I've learned to know this gentleman. Since the beginning of the space transportation system in the shuttle era in the 1980, actually 1970s, he was involved in important management positions that developed the space shuttle operations flow to reprocess America's reusable space fleet. And called upon on all the accident boards and so forth like that, what I find fascinating is you read 7,000 or more applicants from people wanting to be astronauts in 1979, didn't you? Well, it was for the crew of 70, the class of 1978, and we got the applications in in 19... 77 and went went through myself and George, George Abbey was the chairman of the selection of the selection board and we George and I went through every single one of the and then you had to interview 220 of them and then the the selection board interviewed 220 and ended up picking 35 35 that was the uh, those uh, the in fact I got you gave me this T-shirt here I had handy there there you go. That right there is what you chose, right? That's right, 35 new guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to wear that. It's a little heavy. Now it's got a little winter down here. Yeah. I can wear yeah. it there, but I, I appreciate that. Uh, uh, well, today we're going to talk about the 1960s and training for the Apollo moon flights by the flight controllers at, in Houston, and he's going to end up talking about uh, four of the famous ones there. Um, and uh, during part one, we talked about putting the Apollo program together in steps, Today we focus on the Johnson, uh, Johnson Space Center flight simulations that put it all together. And uh, like I said, we left off talking about the structure of this room behind us here that Jay Honeycutt's gonna go into. About 40 engineers at this console behind our green screen. Uh, the sim operators where Jay was, Marty, you're gonna point out that room for us if you can get the handle there where Jay lived. Uh, they restored, this is the restored version of it. There's your office back there. Uh, you Have you gotten back to visit it? Yeah, we, we were out there a while back and we got a mm -hmm. tour. Of the, they just rent, just completed the renovation of uh, <clears throat> of the control center. They don't use it anymore as a, to control any of the space station activities, but uh, it's well, on you, their tour. To, but Jay, you talked about there was two floors and they were identical and uh, uh, what I what I find that this gentleman and others put together was when we're going to the moon, 
from flight director Chris Kraft to the person that made that widget or bolt or whatever, you had a clear communication line to them if something happened, which it did on Apollo 13, of course. Even a fuse box at Johnson Space Center uh, Flight Control Building came in to blame. We'll talk about that later. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Mr. Honeycut. And uh, let me know when you want me to show a couple little graphics that we didn't have time okay. to polish up. So, okay, you could start by dropping a mister. Uh, in the first part, we we talk primarily about the the facilities and the and the structure of the training program, both for the flight crew and the flight controllers. The two separate organizations, but some common equipment was used and some common philosophy was used in, in uh, training both groups. T today, we're gonna try to go through the, the uh, how the control center actually worked uh, and, uh, and the types of things that we did to, to prepare them within the control center and the flight crew to operate as a team. That was our primary goal was to build a team out of a large group of type A personalities that uh, had a lot of confidence, a lot of capabilities, and, and our job was to build a mutual trust in each of the organizations and uh, and give them confidence that they could work together to execute the mission requirements. The uh, the control center, if you can envision this uh, this one chart, the, the operation philosophy of the control center was you had a big block at the top, which you probably may not be able to see on there, but you had a big yeah, good, block right? on the top, which was center management. And then under that was the operations room. It was called the MOKER or mission operations control room. And in there uh, sat the flight director and then a, a number of discipline experts in uh, in each of the fields, guidance, flight dynamics, uh, ret ret uh, retrofire or, or uh, in the mission uh activities the booster console was in there and then you had electrical uh, specialists control system specialists mechanical specialists the capcom who was one of the uh who was an astronaut that was not on the flight but had trained with them was a principal was in fact the only communicator uh with the uh with the flight crew during the mission with the exception of of any private medical uh, conversations that they might have had with the with the doctors. So the surgeon, flight surgeon, was in there at a console. The network controller, the one that interfaced the control center with the worldwide network. In those days, there were no uh, track and daily relay satellites like you have today that give uh, continuous coverage between the spacecraft and the ground. Back in those days, you had a series of ground stations around the world on the east and west coast of of the U.S. Uh, in the Canary Islands and in in Spain and and uh, and in Australia and Hawaii, and Guam, and then back across the states. And the network controller uh, coordinated the activities of uh, those people. You had a con uh, you had a console position called procedures uh, that uh, dealt with how how you get things done within within the confines of the control center, you had a flight activities uh, officer who, who was a primarily developer of the, of the, of the flight crew activities for the day. And, uh, and then you had a communications console that dealt with uh, both air to ground and uh, communications and with the television uh, activities that they conducted both on orbit and on the lunar surface. Uh, and then under those was a was a uh, uh, each of those console positions had a had a had a had a room of support a support room that had maybe anywhere between twenty and and forty people in it who were discipline experts for the various components in each one of those categories. And then there was a room called the spacecraft planning and analysis room, which was the primary interface between the mission control center, the real-time operations group, and the rest of the team that was supporting the mission, which consisted 
of uh, the engineering team at JSC and the contractors in the mission evaluation room, the prime contractors in each of the in each of the uh, um, major contractor facilities, the vendors that provided uh, equipment to those contractors, and the suppliers that provided parts to the vendor to make the parts that they gave to the prime. And in addition, the SPAN communicated with the other NASA centers, NASA headquarters, and academia if they had if they had some uh, contribution to make to the mission. Nothing, no, no, nobody could communicate directly into the room where the flight, main flight control team was without going through the space, spacecraft planning and analysis. Team, it was sort of the filter. If the if the mission control team wanted something, that's where they went to get it. If somebody outside that group wanted something from the flight control team, that's where they came to give. Uh, Jay, I just get, asked uh, this question that this you did not have a template like this. Uh, you created this. No, well, no yeah, other well, I mean, industry the, in America that's, had that's this. That's the. Right? Uh, but that's the way data flowed in and out. Our management decisions were made. Uh, the flight crew would would uh, uh, perhaps report a problem. Hey, we got this. It would come down. The Capcom would would receive it and communicate with the crew. Everybody in the building was listening to what the crew had to say, but the Capcom was the primary interface with them. He would then ask the flight director what he wanted to do with this particular issue, whatever it was. The flight director would go to one of these discipline experts to see if they could provide uh, an answer of what we want to do. If they didn't have a ready answer, they went then to their staff support room. If if you couldn't get the answer there, then you went to the to span and to the uh, to the um, all out of the building engineering experts to give an opinion. And then then when that opinion was formed, it went back up basically back up that same chain till it got back to the to the flight director and he would decide, yeah, we want to tell the crew to do that. He would tell the Capcom, pass it up. And if you ever listen to any of the of the uh, of the uh, transmissions between the, the control center and the crew, you always hear this beep before the uh, before the the conversation started. And that beep occurred when the Capcom would key his microphone. He was the only console position actually the flight director had the capability but he was the only console position that would key that it was called a quindar they would key the quindar to allow communications to go out of the building up to the flight crew and come back so every time you hear the ground talking to the crew the first thing you hear is beep and then you hear the conversation going on and that beep is is enabling the the link between the the, the vehicle on orbit and the and the flight and the room, the flight, the mission operations control room. So that's how the problems got uh, got got worked, and how how things got done within within the uh, within the room within the control center. Our job was to was to to practice that uh, in the sim simulation world. Our job was to practice that uh, up and down the the uh, the chain procedural loop that we we just went through. So, so we would, as we discussed in in uh, in the first part, we had the capability to simulate everything outside of the of the uh, of the building. Uh, we could simulate the the, uh, the ground stations around the world. We could simulate the uh, the all the, all the communications delays that were that that enabled conversations, et cetera. Etc. So our our job was to 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 uh, practice uh, uh, parts of the mission, uh, either procedures that we weren't sure that they were going to be able. That they said they they were if this happened they were going to do this, and then our job was to say, well, can you really do that in the in a real time environment? So we would put in conditions that would enable them to have to go through and verify. One of their procedures, they went. They had a series of uh, of rules called mission rules, which says if this happens on orbit, this is what you do. Uh, and again, we would we would analyze those and say, well, 
Is that really what you would want to do in that situation? Or does it fit within the solution that you've come up, up with? Does that fit within the time that would be allowed and the communications difficulties that you would have because you keep having data and then you drop it out when you lose one of these ground stations and you pick them back up again when you get to the next station. So what, so we practiced all that. That's what the sim world did. And they had, as you mentioned earlier, they had 40 or so people in that room. We, we, had, we had a team of about seven or eight people that, uh, that, that uh, uh, consisted of the simulation supervisor, who, which is sort of our equivalent of the flight director, who managed the sim team decided what types of issues we would we would uh, uh, that we wanted to test and and the timing of of entering them into the into the flow and and uh, and then deciding basically how how well the crew, the flight control team would uh, respond to it. So we, so our team consisted of of the simulation supervisor, we had one person that that worried about the trajectory of uh, of uh, the, were we in the was our system giving them the right uh, the right trajectory parameters that they would use. We had <clears throat> we had one person that worried with all the command service module uh, systems. We had one person that worried with all the lunar module systems. We had one guy that worried with the Saturn launch vehicle. And we also had the capability of simulating the crew if if they were not available. We had a position we call Astro Sim, which which would allow us to conduct simulations with the flight control team when the crew was not uh, available to participate. And uh, and then we had also a communications uh, coordinator that worried with all the uh, with all the the uh, data flow throughout the system to make sure the right things were coming in from to the control center from out of our uh, out of our system and going out and and the, the system was reacting correctly to the controls to the controls that were sent to it by the teams so we put problems in we had some ground rules for doing that uh, first and foremost was we had to be realistic you can't you couldn't put in something that uh, that, uh, that and you, you can't judge what's going to necessarily judge what's going to really happen or what's not. But but anything we put put in, you had to be it had to be solvable. You had to be able the crew had to have a way working with the people on the ground to solve the problem. It wasn't our intent to kill the crew. It wasn't our intent to to destroy the mission. We might cause an abort of the mission and cause it to be terminated early but it would have a satisfactory uh, ending we also had to worry with the uh, with not overloading the team I mean there's 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 one flight director and if you gave every one of those console positions a problem at the same time he <clears throat> he would be unable to deal with that that volume of of, uh, of issues and therefore the sim would become uh, unrealistic so we so we had to manage enough things to keep everybody sort of busy without without overloading the flight director. And the easiest way sort of to do that was just uh, each one of these console positions had a uh, had a voice loop that they communicated with their back with their backroom staff support people. So so we listened into all those. Uh, we listen to all those loops. We listen to the flight director loop. We listen to air to ground, and and the simulation supervisor's job was to sort of listen to the flight director loop and and just just how much traffic was on it would give an indication of how hard he was having to work to keep the, the mission going. And so we try to modulate the the workload on the flight director and then let that filter down to the various console positions. As I mentioned, we 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 didn't try to kill anybody. We we would put in solvable, realistic problems, and that would be leaks uh, in various uh, uh, components, uh, temperature changes, uh, loss of uh, loss of insight. Almost every parameter had a 
telemetry transducer that you could measure its uh, you could measure its performance. Sometimes we we take away that insight from the telemetry perimeters, and then we'd fail the system behind it. So they'd have to find alternate ways to verify that their system was uh, working and how, how they might uh, fix it. We'd put in your degradations. The engine performs at only 80% of its thrust value. Uh, uh, we put drifts in the, the uh, inertial guidance system was driven by some uh, inertial platforms that had gyroscopes in them. You could put drifts in the, in the, in the gyroscopes, which would cause the vehicle to sort of drift off its in, intended uh, uh, parameters. We would do, uh, we would do, uh, uh, we would take away vo voice loops. We would take away uh, a telemetry loop coming into the building. The vehicle comes up over a ground station and, and you couldn't get voice with them or you couldn't get, you couldn't get telemetry from them. You couldn't command problem you know problems like that uh, as you mentioned earlier we would do uh we would do building problems in the uh in the uh, in the mcc one one of my favorites was we we uh we failed a breaker they had these giant breaker boxes circuit breaker boxes like you have in your home but they'd have like two or three hundred breakers in this big box uh, they were feeding the whole, say, the second floor or the third floor control room, and I failed one of those breakers. Took out, took out you know, twenty percent of the consoles in the oh, main, wow. in the main room, and uh, and it took them forever to figure out from the drawings. It took them forever to figure out where the failure had actually occurred. So, so the the, the next day we went in for another sim, and the, and the and you went went on the second floor of the control room, and they had these wiring diagrams rolled out on the floor with colored pencils, <laughs> uh, tracing lines out and, and where they which breaker they went to, so that they could develop a quick look. If you lose this capability, this is the breaker box, and <laughs> and the thing Mark likes that the the spare breakers were actually up at at uh, Ellington Field, which was uh, uh, one of the adjunct places to. Johnson Space Center. It was about a ten-minute, fifteen-minute ride up there to uh, to where they had the breaker. So they fi so they figured out which breaker was broken. They came in and said, "Well, we fi we figured out the breaker. Can we re replace it?" And I said, "With what?" And they said, "Well, with another breaker." I said, "Well, where's that breaker?" They said, "Well, it's <laughs> up at Ellington." I said, "Well, go get it." Because <laughs> so to demonstrate how, how long it was going to take to get up there and get it back and get it installed. So that was a that was a simple problem, but it turned into a, a major, basically, modification of how the people within the building, the support people within the building, manage their electrical their electrical elements within uh, in yes. the center. We would we one one other time we we uh, the end console on uh, in the front row up there was where the guidance officer sat, and the guidance officer was the one console position that during the lunar landing was go for all those uh, computer alarms that that uh, were occurring so, so and the, and the, and it was I mean these were the days the early days of computers so all the flooring in that room was all uh, was all computer floor and all the wires and everything were underneath the floor and they were all in these four by four squares uh, or three by three squares. And so we got in there in the middle of the night and had one of the techs put a piece of string on the on the main console power and the guidance officer's computer displays. And then we got in the middle of a of a, one of the landing sims and we pulled his breaker and oh. popped his screen where where he couldn't he couldn't see what you know what the vehicle was doing during the landing. And you know their their response was everybody shifted <laughs> shifted over one console. He quickly got it back up, uh, but but that we put in those kinds of problems just to just to to give the building people who weren't you know they weren't real time uh, operators by any stretch were, were equally important to the success of what we were trying to do to give them an opportunity to feel like they were part of the 
hmm. practicing for. Uh, I love that attitude, the, Jay. Uh, the kind of thinking outside the box so much when you're thinking yeah. these tricky sim operators are just throwing curveballs at the mission and so forth. If you've ever been to Houston, you know there's some hellacious storms in the afternoon there and so forth. Did that ever happen where the lights went out? Uh, uh, no, you know, I mean, there, there was sufficient there was sufficient backup. Uh, right. Uh, uh, I think we talked in the other, Ken, in, in the uh, other part, the real-time computer, uh, the, the mission support computer, uh, did, did, did all the real-time processing for the flight, they had they had a dynamic standby. There was its identical machine, and they and they ran they ran in parallel uh -huh. at all times. So it so in in the event that the that the main uh, computer went down, it just switched over to the to the backup one, and you couldn't miss a you didn't really miss a beat. So they were they were covered for like a lightning strikes the knocks the payload out. They I mean the the building out of power they had sufficient backup to to uh, preclude that from happening we were down sort of in the bowels of the control center just pulling little things just to uh, just to remind them but who would have happen. thought about that on the moon voyages that you'd you know you got the building people all involved yeah. in and so the, the, yeah, I, yeah. I think you have a picture here of the profile of the of the, of the lunar uh, yeah we'll, we'll go up uh, here the to mission. uh yeah. there's the great chris craft of course we we had right there a uh, couple pi pictures of the restored they spent a lot of money restoring it uh with ashtrays and coffee cups and so forth for this going to the moon which we haven't done in 51 years right now today apollo 17 about a third of the way the moon launched the only night launch of the saturn 5 Rocket, Mr. Honeycutt, did you experience that yourself here? I or did. William Johnson I Space did. Center? I did. What was that like for you? Marty did too, so you both yeah. saw it. Uh, as, as a matter of fact, on on the, on uh, Apollo seventeen, I had I had uh, uh, this the, when the when the flights came, the sim guys didn't didn't really you know our work was done uh, in the in the. In the words of some of the flight controllers, you know, you guys don't have to take the final. Oh, yeah, right. Uh, That's right. But, but we support it in other ways. In other words, that room where that we uh, pointed out earlier, uh -huh. that's where the headquarters uh, contingent that would come down for the mission would would sit in there, and, and, uh, and they were unfamiliar with the nuts and bolts of everyday activities of flight. So the sim guys kind of, would help them understand what was going on during the various oh, really? activities that that were uh, the various directors yeah, or, the, or yeah supervisors. You know, the, big, the big guys from headquarters mm -hmm. uh that you know of course you try to keep away from <laughs> from the real-time operators mm -hmm. uh and and so i worked with that one mission i uh i sat in the control room with roy neal who was uh in the in the, in the, the back of the mcc you can't see over there, but there's a viewing room back there, and the viewing room ha it was about big as a phone booth, just enough for two people to sit. And they would uh, the uh, the high dollar uh, TV guys uh, when they came down, Cronkite and Jules Bergman and and Roy Neal from I NBC would come down, and they would they would do their stuff from those the, one of those rooms. So one flight, I I was with, with Roy Neal giving him the, you know, here's what's going on kind of background. And then one one flight, I had uh, I had uh, uh, the guy that wrote Space and uh, Missioner. Missioner. I had I had he I, I sat up there with him during oh, the okay. during the flight. And then and then on seventeen, they came in and they said, well, uh, we we want you to take. Uh, and all these consoles were three shift operation. Every every position in there was a three shift operation. So you'd go through the handovers from shift to shift. Eight hours shift. So they so mm -hmm. they you know there would be about a, a hour handover uh, overlap between them. So they could here's what went on mm -hmm. in in my shift, and so the guy coming on was fully briefed when when it became his 
job. And, and so anyway, they came in. They said, "On for seventeen, we don't have anybody to to be the the uh, second shift manager in this in the span. The, that room that was is the was a filter for all the people to come. Um, you know, they wanted to get stuff in and out of the out of the flight control room. So they said, "You're going to be the second shift." Span manager. I said, well, okay. But <laughs> that's going to go on because we're going to launch on first shift and I'll just be sitting up there. Well, it sh <laughs> launch shifted into the, you know, mm -hmm. the, it was a delay of this, that, or the other. Anyway, the launch occurred on my shift. So I started my re real time career as a, uh, with a, uh, you know, the active launch. Thrown in the fire. Yeah. First yeah. One. Wow. Uh, and I'm sure you did well. So at it. you know, I mean, I didn't get fired for it. So, so, uh, so anyway, back to the sim world. The uh, the mission was broken up into uh, into into phases. You you had you had launch phase, and then it got it, it got on orbit. Uh, and in launch phase, there were there were there were three abort modes that you could have, where you if you lost the engine. At various times in the Saturn during during a first or second stage, it, you couldn't make it to orbit, so you had to you had to abort. It wasn't like shuttle where there was an abort stage that said you could return to the landing site. You couldn't excuse me, you couldn't return to the landing site. But mode one aborts. I may get this wrong because it's been fifty years ago. But mode one of aborts put you in the water. Mode two uh also put you in the water mode three put you in in uh africa lake chad and then there was a last mode four was actually a little almost to orbit so you could get a little bump and get and get into orbit but you burned enough of the of the s4b that you couldn't do the, the lunar mission you know mm -hmm. you could, couldn't get out of earth orbit uh, so you had those four abort modes during uh during launch, and then it would go up and, and do several revs in in Earth orbit, and then they would light the the uh, S4B, and you and that would get you out of Earth orbit on the way to the Moon. Once you got once that burn was completed, the uh, the com the the uh, you separate. But well, once it was completed, you you separate the command module. It would fly around and go down and pick up Marty's lunar module and back it up out of the out of the enclosure that was set up on top of the S4B, and then the only thing that went off to the moon was the combination of the command and service module and the lunar module, and the S4B went wherever it went. I think it. Sometimes they aimed it at the moon to yeah. later on to test yeah. the, the vibrations uh, off there. So then you had a couple of three days of coast. And you had to do, you had to do bar, you know, you had to. They call it the barbecue mode. You had to, tr to allow the vehicle to slowly turn from, uh, on its on its axis, so you c keep the, the temperatures, uh, even all the way around the vehicle. Not that one side get really cold and the other side get really mm -hmm. hot. And then you get near the moon and you do a burn, that would slow you down to get you into Earth into lunar orbit. And then you fly a few orbits around that. Then you would you would separate the the lunar module from the command module. Do the the descent burn. Go down, land. Do their do their lunar surface activities, and then the crew would get back and and uh, and the 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 descent stage of the of the lunar module was the launch pad for the. Uh, for the return of the ascent stage to uh, back up to, to lunar orbit to rendezvous with the command service module. You, then you do a burn to come out of out of lunar orbit and head back to uh, to the Earth where you'd land out in the Pacific. So those were the primary phases of the of the mission. We practiced every one of those hmm. with the crew, uh, and in those days there were there was a prime crew and a backup crew so the prime crew would get the predominance of the runs but you would do a couple you do a couple of days with with the backup crew on each uh, on each one of the the uh, 
phases that we ran 20, 25, 30, it, you know, it kind of depended on how much time you had and, and the, 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 the maturity of the crew ground combination as to how many days you had, a, you ran on each one of them. But in, in the, in the, uh, uh, in the net, it was around 25 or 30 days per, per mission spread out over all those. Hmm. Mission phases spread out over a prime and a backup mm -hmm. crew. May I ask uh, this question here a second? And we wanted to remind everyone we've recorded this show with Mr. J. Honeycutt. So if you do have questions, I'll be reading them and I'll make sure I get back to him and we'll answer them someday uh, in the near future. Of course, we're going to have Jay back hopefully many times here uh, as he wants to share with us uh, his incredible career. Uh, I was. I wanted to ask, did you? It's a three-day mission to the moon. One day on the moon with Apollo eleven, and then three days back. Uh, you didn't have the guys three days in a row swapping out, did you? No, no, no. Uh, no you you broke no, or no, the astronauts. No. You would break it yeah. up in certain sections yeah, during the, the mission the, um, and pick it up. Or did you say that's enough for today? We'll pick it up uh, next week. Uh, well, we would. I mean the the. Um, the types of sims were were defined in that it, to, today we're going to run launch boards. We ran launch boards. Okay. Uh, tomorrow, uh, to, you know, tomorrow you guys are off doing, you know, lunar surface geology or whatever, and we'll see you on Thursday. And and on Thursday we're going to do TLS translunar sims. injection or something. Yeah, and okay. and and so there were the 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 the. Um, the typical, uh, it, 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 the, uh, the, you can set those over here. Dave. Well, I got a picture here I want to okay. remind myself of. Um, We're talking with Mr. Jay Honeycutt here. Of course, he was the director at Kennedy Space Center. A lot of people remember his tenure there. That was happened to be during the beginning of the Mir yeah. space station shuttle launches i think you were involved there were 16 yeah. shuttle launches and we're talking about the 1960s and when yeah. he was uh, one of those tricky sometimes evil sims guys yeah so the, <laughs> the 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 integrated training phase for each flight was roughly three months uh the flights were two months apart and so the reason you know, one one reason for having the second and third floor mission control rooms was there were there were there were times when when the the, the three months for seven uh, hadn't hadn't expired yet you hadn't launched yet but you started on the other floor you started on the three months of eight in that last month so so you had a you had a month of overlap. Mm -hmm. uh, s s between uh, two successive missions that had to be dealt with in the second floor, third floor thing. So, so there was no problem for the flight control team. It wasn't a problem for the crew because they had lots of them. But we only had one sim, you know, basically one sim team. Right. S so where we'd run three days a week with with uh, crew A on the second floor, and we run three days a week with crew B on the third floor, our guys were running six days a week huh. because, you know, we were, we were supporting both. Working on uh, two Apollo moon both, missions at the same yeah. time. Hmm. Uh, so, but, you know, I mean, that's what made so much fun. And then we get together on Sunday and decide what we're going to do next week. Huh. <laughs> yeah. Jay, may I ask this? You guys, you sim guys had to know the systems as well as the astronauts well not right? as well but we had to know we had to know them that's and why how did we, you learn that well we went that's what we went through the in the in the first part of this thing they had they had uh classroom exercises we had uh we had a we called the crew system trainer for the for the ground guys it was a uh -huh. mock-up of the of the uh of the uh 
uh, mock-up of the inside of the spacecraft. So they, when when they told the crew to throw such and such a switch, they had in their mind a vision of, uh-huh. you know, where that thing was and all that. And and in addition, the the every time they ran a test down here at KSC on the flight hardware, the 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 uh, the flight control team sat in on it in Houston. Mm-hmm. The data would go back to Houston, and the flight control team would sit at their consoles and and uh, and and monitor. I mean, they weren't they weren't running the test. They just but they monitored the test and what. A great story of that was was Apollo 12. Uh, if you remember, Apollo 12, uh, when it launched, it, it got struck by lightning, and and the the uh, the uh, all the crew, all the onboard displays, uh, all went nuts. They they all all of the voltages went off scale high. The the currents went off scale high. The the uh, the, the meters all all went to zero. I mean, every parameter in the in in the side the command module went basically went blank. Didn't matter. I mean, the Saturn was in control of the trajectory, so it wasn't hurting anything. But the crew the crew lost their in, totally lost their insight into the thing. And a young twenty three year old uh, flight controller in Houston by the name of John Aaron, um, the, the Jerry Griffin was a flight director. Griffin said, "What do we do?" John was an econ; they called him the environmental electrical, whatever, whatever. And John said, uh, "Tell him SCE to Ox, which is a kind of a famous <coughs> line." Every yeah, <laughs> everybody, S-C-E-X. including X. the flight director, says, "What the heck is that?" And including Al Bean, who was who was. <laughs> And uh, and it turned out that John had been monitoring a test that they conducted down here where a similar thing had happened, and he and they had they, the the fix had been to reset the it was an instrumentation power switch basically, mm-hmm. which what it was. And so the so during that test they put that switch in the aux position, and that fixed the problems. So he. Yes, absolutely. yeah. That was that was a big fix. I wanted to just say. Oh yeah, I mean it's was, like it's uh, uh, iconic. Yeah, really. absolutely. Uh, it's uh, uh, it's a phrase that they use on space hipsters and stuff. S-C-C yeah, yeah, you see it on coffee cups. Well, that's the that's the history behind that. Yeah, that call. Amazing. One one thing that we had a guest on, I forget Marty who it was. We're talking about Apollo twelve. And they were amazed that during that chaotic time of Apollo 12 being struck by lightning, the alarms going off, the astronauts not knowing if in one second they're going to blow up or anything. They're laughing their back, back ends off. Yeah. Yeah. yeah they're, and, 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 but also Pete Conrad is doing what a test pilot does, is reading what he sees in yeah. front of him and describing it so that you... If they if they if they perish, you would understand a little bit more what was going on. I just find that so fascinating. But they but they were laughing. About it. They were they <laughs> were. It was the it was the, the smallest stage of the Saturn V, the instrument yeah. unit that saved the day. Yeah. Correct. Uh, and and uh, and and but that showed the value of the the flight control team oh, supporting the absolutely. Down here. But that's how they got their. You know, things like that was is how they got there. We didn't teach them how to. I mean, we taught the we taught the cl- classroom stuff, but we didn't teach them how their system works. You know, uh-huh. Kranz was a by then Kranz was the was the uh, uh, Gene Kranz flight control. Yeah, Gene was a, was the division chief for, for flight control, and, and he and he he lived off of uh, off of uh, schematics. Uh-huh. And, and and you know, you know he he his mission book had every system, and he had, had color coded all the lines and where they where the power lines were and where the uh, the fluid lines mm-hmm. went and all that sort of stuff. And he ingrained he ingrained that in to most every one of the systems guys mm-hmm. that in that room. So they knew, I mean, they knew the system, and 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 this earlier Christmas tree of you guys, mm-hmm. you know, you run all the way down to the to the vendor guys. 
normally what they were doing with those guys was getting a, was getting a verification that their that their impression of what the problem was was correct. Well, it kind of had to, that was so valuable yeah, for Apollo thirteen, yeah, yeah, obviously. Yeah. There. So so those guys, those flight control guys, were very very knowledgeable about how those system how those system works. In addition, they had studied them like crazy because they had they had 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 to write mission rules that say if this part of this thing breaks what are we going to do uh -huh. they had to write the procedures uh that if we get into this kind of a situation and we need this thing how do we how do we use it so so they i mean they knew they were ever bit as good as anybody that ever flew as the knowledge of uh, probably more knowledgeable than than the guys that flew uh which is what which is the way it should have been because you you want these guys with their heads all full of all this information well, when you got 400,000 people on the ground to help you. Right, and I've been around Mr. Honeycutt, and one of your mantras is you don't want to be the smartest person in the room <laughs> when you've got all these other smart yeah. people that have 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 expertise that, that you do deep trouble into, if I'm the so. smartest one. Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> I said you'd be in deep trouble if I was the smartest one. Oh, well, uh, 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 well, we're enjoying this conversation yeah. with Mr. Jay Honeycutt. It's recorded. If you got a question, put it in there. Marty and I will note it and get back to him. He's going to do a few more things along this line here. Um, and uh, to continue there, Mr. Honeycutt, yeah. with uh, where we were at there. Yeah, so so we broke the missions up into, into the various phases. And we'd use the, we'd use the simulators for all of them except the lunar surface stuff we the, the lunar the lunar surface sims were kind of were kind of a paper sims we call them you know you just run out there and you give them a uh -huh. piece of paper said this happened you know because it it, it was hard it, it was the crew had all the knowledge of geology and all that sort of stuff so what, what all we did with the lunar surface stuff was sort of ensure that the procedures related to things like setting up the TV or unloading the, um, un when the rover flew in the latter missions, unloading the rover, you know, those kinds of things. We did a little bit of that, but, but primarily it was fly, flying kind of types of things mm -hmm. that we did. Uh, Man, you we never did, did anything like a pipe broke on the limb. We're out here. We got to get in no, and lift no. off in, in an hour or something no, like that. Never uh, did a, a emergency abort on the surface that you recall. No, I did one. I did one one time on on Shepard's Al Shepard's flight fourteen. Because uh, what I do is everybody was putting out notes. All the engineering guys would put out notes. There was a guy named. Um, Named Bill Tyndall, who you should read about sometime, who who was as, as important as anyone, any single person in making that all that stuff happen. Tyndall, I've Bill seen that Tyndall, name. Yeah, uh, uh, he 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 would write. He he was the the uh, mission techniques. Here's how you're gonna do. Here's how you're gonna do all these very things. So so we we'd monitor. We'd go to his meetings, and we'd listen to. We'd listen to the kind of the discussion. We weren't participants, uh, but we would listen to the discussions and where there were where there were um, issues or uh, lack the la lack of maybe universal agreement that this is a way to do it. Well, we'd make a note of that, and then the next time we ran a sim, we'd put that situation in to to make sure that mm -hmm. what they said they wanted to do was really what they want to do in the in the light of real time operation. Uh -huh. and, and we do the same thing with the mission rules where they which were if this happens if this breaks this is what you what you do. We sit in all those reviews and uh, and where there were any amount of contention whatsoever, then we try to get that into a sim to make sure that in the in the you know, so, sort of heat of the battle you still want to you still want to do what you said you want to do because uh -huh. that was really w what we considered our job to be. We were, we, we weren't there to to teach them anything because uh, they were all smart, you know, they were all smarter than we were. 
for, for that matter, because they dedicated to the specific thing they're doing. Our job was to was to sort of flush out wh where where there were disagreements or uh, uh, more than one uh, way of doing something. Let, let's throw this in, and you guys decide in a in a real time environment mm -hmm. decide what because you know you can't you can't go home and and call a meeting tomorrow and decide what you're gonna do. You got to do. You got five minutes. To, you got you know the 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 Hawaii Pass is coming up. You got five minutes to decide what what you want to tell the crew to, to talk do, to them. And you know, get them so right so those were the kinds of things we we did. Uh, uh, to, you know, with the ultimate goal of just trying to make sure that we had a, a, a team. We, we, you know, we we wouldn't go to the flight director and say, "Well, I think you ought to you ought to." change out Marty. I don't think he's, you know, I don't think he's up to this. We, we never considered that to be our job. The okay. flight, well, what we did do was we'd expose him to issues and then the flight director could, could decide, hey, I'm still confident in this guy or, uh, you know, maybe we I'm better, not. maybe we better swap him out or maybe, or they'd come to us, say, run a couple more, run see a couple more things. It. Let me see how he, Handles that so, so you know we had a we had a good relationship with the flight directors and 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 you know we would help them when they mm. when you know when if if they didn't normally do that I mean you know my I probably told you the story before but when I first started doing that it was for it was before Kraft went to be the uh, to be the center director he was still ahead of flight operations and 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 I was brand new I had my uh, it was Apollo 7, and the first time I was doing it, simulating the supervisor stuff, I, I had only laid eyes on craft through all them windows and the doors between between where He's our room where was. And his, right yeah, there. and, 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 and his there. console is about where your head is. Uh -huh. And that's the closest I'd ever been to him. And all of a sudden, I looked up, and he walked in the door. Now in your office. In my, in my little room. room there. And he plugs in, had his headset on, he plugged in. Looked at me and he said, and Kranz was the flight director for that particular day, oh. and he and he and Gene at that point was my division chief, <laughs> and uh, and you know he said, uh, I'll clean it up. He said, you know, <laughs> does Kranz or any of these flight directors giving you any trouble? And I said, well, well, no, sir. He said, well, if they do give you any trouble, he said you come tell me because when <clears throat> when you're sitting on this job, you're working directly for me. Ah. Unplugged, walked out. I never used that. You know, I always felt like I had that in my head box, but I never, you know, I didn't ever want to use that because I just didn't, you know, I just didn't want to. And here but, you're talking to the but, man who created the flight yeah, control job flight, that yeah, he went through Mercury control. and Gemini already, and he's empowering yeah, you yeah. with confidence there. That had to have been really a, a yeah. moment for you, Jay. That's what made him what he was. I mean, he was an incredible manager of people. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, I mean, he, 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 he was a, you know, he was the original guy that, you know, he, he'll give you just as much rope as you can carry. Huh. And, uh, but well, I think you, you learned a lot you, from you, him. You, you for made sure, one, you know, you, you made one mistake and you, you know, he, ask he, Scott he, Carpenter yeah, that question. Yeah. Huh? yeah he, you know, you don't, uh, uh, but, but in general, we, you know, we would emphasize, uh, the more dynamic stuff, you know, launch phase in in particular because it was a it was a you know a highly intense in, environment. Obviously, uh, obviously, descent was a you know highly intensive environment. Some of the some of the other things, you know, not so much. I mean, you're going to do lunar orbit insertion. You you. You get up to the moon, you get the vehicle all ready, you go behind the moon, it does burn and it comes back it comes back out in lunar orbit. So you don't you know, there's no dynamic there's no you know, dynamic contri contribution of the guys on the ground to the event because it you know, it's behind the moon. So, you know, we didn't spend near as much time on that sort of thing as we did the ones where they were 
you know, where they were in concert. Mm -hmm. Concert coverage. Well, I know you have a summary there, but we I know everybody wants to ask you. Um Apollo thirteen. All this we, training we came, didn't, to, uh, came to yeah. a, a major point. Yeah, we course. we didn't do exactly Apollo thirteen, but we we had done a uh, we had done a couple of things that were you know, that waved off you know, waved off lunar insertion kinds of things, but nothing as dramatic as as an a, oxygen Apollo tank 13. blowing up. <laughs> uh, you know, same way with the with the uh, with the with the program alarms in uh, in the you know, on the landing day. Um, uh, we had 11, on Apollo alarms, eleven. Yeah. We had done. We we had a, we had in fact done those, and that's the reason that that Steve Bales, Bales and so and Garmin were 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 able to make the calls because because we had one of the other guy one of the other sims guys had put in the things and they and again it Gene was doing the landing so it's his team and they said what you know what are these and what do we do and so he sent that that, that whole Bales and that, his whole team off to figure out what all these computer alarms are and what we're going to do about them. Because if you listen to the air to ground, when when uh, they are talking about the alarms, Charlie Duke says, "Yeah, we we've seen that before," and uh, that's what he was referring to. That we we had had that not uh, had that not happened in the sim world, there's a damn good chance they would have avoided the 1201 and 1202 yeah, yeah, famous alarms yeah, in there. Yeah, because if you listen to that. You listen carefully to that that landing. It, it was not a piece of cake, right? I mean, there was that was going on. The the landing radar thing was going on. The, there was static. They lost they lost data. They lost lock. They Two lost, miles. Yeah, off. that was all. You know, there was a whole range. I mean, the fact that Kranz could keep his keep his cool through that whole thing was just remarkable yeah. because there was. I mean, there were four, I think, four different opportunities to have just yeah. called it off. How about Neil Armstrong, too, yeah, <laughs> flying yeah. the thing oh, so coolly? And, well, uh, but Apollo 13, uh, afterwards, you all had to have just a, a, a relief satisfaction. Oh, certainly, yeah, yeah, certainly, off, but... yeah. Well, and, they, and so what, what they did was they, uh, they called up our system during that and all the things that, they were doing. They were using the, the simulators over in the in the in the flight crew in the flight crew building. They weren't using the ones down here, but they would come up with all these. Uh, Aaron, Aaron was working on a whole bunch of different power down scenarios to save. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, to, 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 because of, you know they didn't have much power, uh, and they would they would they called up the simulators in a, in our system and they. Ken Mattingly led most yeah, of that, Ken and they Mattingly. did. They did all their, uh, you know, they ran through all the stuff that went up to the crew. All of that had been verified by, uh, you know, by the guys on the ground using the the sim <clears throat> the sim system. Hmm. Uh, well, I think you've summarized your thing there. We wanted you to talk a little bit about the four major yeah. uh, flight controllers. Well, yeah, just, but, let, let me go this. Yeah, go ahead this, there. And then I want uh, a couple you know, the, questions for you. Sort of my summary was, you know, the SIMS provided training for 11 crewed, three Saturn unmanned, and, and one unmanned limb flight. I mean, we did, you know, all those things. You know, 24 astronauts were trained to go to the moon. Three made two flights, 12 walked on the moon. Uh, all the flights were successful with no major missteps or safety issues on the ground or in the air, you know, I mean, you Apollo 13 notwithstanding, uh, no, you know, nobody died in, a, in, in, you know, in the missions got Successful back to the ground, you know, the Sims are worth the time and, uh, and made contributions to the program success. Every one of them, you know, everybody will tell you that. Uh, Skylab, we did mostly the same types of things. Uh, Apollo Apollo Soyuz was was the, the fun one. Oh yeah. Uh, because first of all, you had the language barrier. Okay. And then they wanted to do integrated simulations. Well, 
and it's now you you know to put it in context this is before Tedris and there was no satellite satellite communications everything was on landlines and and uh, big the, fish the, antennas the, in Canada yeah, Australia the, uh, California. associated you know delays associated with all that the Russian control center or the suit they call it looked just like that only bigger <laughs> you know first time we went in there was you know it's a it's our control center, but it had an extra row of consoles and bigger plot boards uh-huh. in the front because they just copied what, you know, what we had. Huh. But their, you know, their control center was, uh, was, was up. Their crews were in Baikonur, which is an hour drive. I'm not Baikonur in Star City, which is a which is an hour drive from the, from where the control center was in right. downtown Moscow. Okay. Our flight crews were down here at KSC and the simulators, and our Mission control team was in Houston and the MCC, and we, the Sim World, we wired all those guys together, and and ran simulations. You know, we ran right. integrated sims with all four of those <clears throat> things hooked up. Their flight director was was uh, was was their chief flight director actually was my <clears throat> was my counterpart, and uh, and and he and I had the opportunity to set up all this, you know, all the cases that we were going to run. It was, it was really cool. I mean, it was really huh. amazing that it it worked, given <clears throat> today's, you know, today's ease of doing that sort of thing with teachers and all this stuff. A lot more handshakes had. going on than just between yeah. uh, Lexi Leonoff and Tom Stafford and the spacecraft, it sounds like, to make that work. That's a So, what, you know, what, what, what actually guys before me, Harold, Harold Miller and Dick Coos and Carl Shelley and guys out in in uh, in Houston started the simulation world when when they were at Langley for for Mercury and they brought it down to Houston and 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 we just slowly slowly built it up philosophically. I haven't been involved in it now in 25 or 30 years, but I'm sure that what they do today for <clears throat> for Space Station and whatever they'll be doing for the Artemis crew will be essentially the same. I mean, it's not... You built the blueprint there's for not much. There's not much of any other way you can Absolutely. do it. You know, you got more computers and more data and more access and quicker this and quicker <laughs> that, but the fundamental trail of of how it, it should be you know should be done is uh, well, basically think, that think, we told you it's a 1960s yeah, show yeah. today where but yeah th- that that doesn't change at all uh your uh your your timeline there of, or your tree of responsibilities and stuff there but jay i'd like to ask you you dealt with all of the commanders of all these wonderful moon missions on there um Mr. Frank Borman just passed away. Uh, what a mission that had to have been for the Sim people to uh, 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 train for. Well, we uh, went. Tom we, Stafford yeah, is 92 yeah. years old. A little comment about dealing with uh, maybe Mr. Borman and we. Uh, I mean, I started it with uh, with uh, Shiraz crew on, on uh, seven on seven, and you really didn't know when you were gonna when you were gonna launch. So. so so we would we would do a sim on Tuesday and one on Thursday. Next week we do it on Tuesday and one on Thursday. We just did for over a year, you know, every Tuesday, every Thursday. And and Shiraz crew was uh, uh, they weren't undisciplined, but they were they the pressure of, free spirit maybe. Well, the, but <laughs> I mean the pressure of we got you know we only got so much time. To get this done because we're going to go fly it kind of wasn't there because you didn't know when you were going to go fly yeah the recovery you know? after yeah Apollo so, 1, of so, course, so they right. were kind of um you know you schedule something for you know sim to start eight o'clock Houston time and um nine o'clock down here and you know they most times they wouldn't be ready you know they'd be on the phone or they'd be Doing this, or they drinking be, coffee, doing what you know. Well, anyway, they w- they wouldn't be 
suited and in the simulator. So next up is Borman's crew. And, <laughs> and so I went over there to their building and, and I, I went to Borman's office. I didn't know him, but I went and I said, look, you know, he, here's the deal. I mean, we schedule one of these sims. You know, I've got maybe a thousand, fifteen hundred people sitting over here in the control center because you got all the flight control team, you got all the people that run the building, you know, the whole first floor is the telemetry guys, the tracking guys, the command wow. guys, all these technicians that do all that work, all these computer get you know, this twelve, fifteen hundred people involved in this thing and uh and and if you guys aren't ready when we say we're, we're, we're you know we're just kind of sitting around he just looked at me and he said when you tell me the sim's gonna start my crew will be there yes sir i think i think they missed one time because the president <laughs> told him <laughs> while they were getting ready to uh -huh. start to send uh -huh. otherwise he was there you How about know, the big it, one, it, Apollo 11? And, uh, and, uh, yeah, and it, you know, they were, you know, they actually, of the integrated sims that we ran, I used to have the numbers, well, the fewest number we ran was with 11. Hmm. Because, because Neil had a lot of, uh, you'll fly the LLTV, so, you know, it was a lot of, uh, a lot more geology and surface stuff going on a lot more geology so their availability uh was was less than most of it i think we ran this uh, you know the combination of the them and the backups i think the backup crew i think was about the same but the the prime crew was the smallest i used to have those numbers it was the smallest number of integrated sims huh. i think that we ran was was for them and the rest of them were all great you know i mean conrad was conrad was great uh john you know john john young john young he was always you know they were they were they were they were all uh you know i mean they were all professionals and they were damn good at what they you know what they did and uh hmm. and they and to their credit they recognized the value added to what we were doing so the you know the crews the crews were never really uh with a you know possible exception of seven crew they the crews were not ever ever hmm. issue. They were i mean they may have been and i don't and i don't know about you know the the flight director to crew commander interface i don't know any of the history of whether there may be any of this that went on with uh -huh. those guys or not and and i d never did want to know, you know um, <laughs> well, let's talk a little about we're going to go out here with jay honeycutt on uh talking about some of these flight the four famous ones here's a uh, jerry griffin who i think him and cliff charlesworth are not as well known as uh looney and Kranz, but uh you got a comment about this gentleman here yeah Jerry, well i'll start with i'll start with Kranz. yeah i mean craft was the flight director yeah and and he originally he was the only flight director and then uh they started to do mercury and they decided well they better have two so uh so they named john hodge who who was who was the first director of of, of the flight control division uh and john was also one of the the uh the canadians it's a show sometime we should do on the uh yeah the Canadian the, influence the Canadian, on Apollo is unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, Chamberlain and yeah. Maynard, two really uh, people that you turned but, me on but, to. Yeah, remember. but John was one. Hodge was one of those, and and he actually he actually left NASA shortly after I went to work. So I never really had any any relationship with him. And then and then Kranz was the third one. Well, uh, let's get uh, got a picture of. Uh, uh, we get him up there. There's uh, there's Kranz. Yeah. You know, Gene Gene was the first one. Gene was Gene. <laughs> uh, I don't know of any I was ever around anybody with a more capacity to work. I mean to do stuff. He, he just 
he's just a human dynamo. A uh, uh, alpha A all the time. Yeah, right? and uh, and uh, if if in in the sim, if if he if he got if 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 we didn't keep him busy, he'd call on some flight director, a flight controller down there, and, and give them a problem. Oh and really? Go, yeah, and say go, you know, go figure out, go figure this out, or go figure that out. I mean, he 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 said a tremendous capacity for uh, huh. for work but uh, if you if you if you if you listen to the flight director loop which is kind of the way I did my stuff the, you know, the volume and the traffic on the flight director loop was was way up here even in the flights you know I mean and Gene's always mm -hmm. and Lonnie comes in and you know it's kind of, it's kind of just Rides along. Here's a, there's craft. We'll yeah. show you Lonnie there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Recently passed yeah. away. Yeah. Ter terrific uh, guys. But all of them are just. I mean, they were just. And uh, terrific that's guys. a guy we don't that's know Charles much about. Boy. Cliff Charles. Yeah. Yeah. There. He's a good Mississippi boy. Uh -huh. And uh, and he 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 was the uh, the most unassuming. The most the the least. Uh, uh, I don't know what the right word is. Charismatic, maybe, is, is, mm -hmm. uh, of of the ones, but well, like but, an introvert but, compared but, to Francis, an extrovert, a, you know, right? Yeah, I mean, of a not a plotter, but a you know, a, a, a constant mover as opposed to a yeah, steady pressure you know, guy. Uh, and and then Jerry, Talking Jerry, about was, Cliff Charles yeah, worked yeah. there, but you know, great guy. There's Jerry, Jerry on yeah, the left. Jerry, there. Uh, you know, Jerry's still a good friend of mine. Jerry, Jerry Griffin does a lot still for yeah, the space yeah, program, like yeah, you do, promoting yeah, he, things on <clears throat> the Houston area, right? Yeah, he uh, he made a huge con <clears throat> contribution to. Uh, and uh, and then there's your uh, your hero, your mentor there, Mr. Chris Kraft. We have on our YouTube channel a little Google Chris Kraft, and there's a. Uh, about a 20 minute thing that's got a lot of views on there. Have you ever watched that? I don't know if I've seen that. Uh, uh, I'll send that to you. He actually uh, says he didn't like coming to Kenny Space Center. He didn't like the restaurants. He didn't like the <laughs> hotels. He liked being in Houston. He, uh, he, he, <laughs> Does that sound he, like him? He was a, he quite opinionated, but uh, <laughs> oh, what a what a guy. Yeah, I, you look up to him, I know, Jay, and I know you learned a lot from him there. Well, we've enjoyed this great conversation with you. You've been highly decorated. There you are getting, is that from your uh, alma mater yeah, there? Yeah, yeah. East, uh, what was that, Lafayette University? Yeah, yeah. yeah. There, and uh, uh, so, uh, uh, Jay, we really appreciate uh, this wonderful look at uh, a side of yourself, but a side of the Apollo program that I think a lot of people yeah. uh, will be enjoying on yeah. that. And uh, Well, you know, as, as you know, one of the things that I'm I'm really worried about is that we're going to lose. It's, it's a little bit like World War II veterans. We're going to lose uh, our history or our <clears throat> our corporate knowledge of what of what it took during these days to mm -hmm. to to do what what was was done and and. You know, I mean, we're getting older and older and older, and there's been less and less and less of the. And 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 I just worry that we that we're, the young people are, are never gonna have an appreciation for. I mean, this was damn hard. <laughs> you, you, I mean, you, you, and and I'm not even certain today you could do it. Yeah. Be because the the. the the situation that we have now, you know, I I just don't know if it if it if, if it could could have been done, and I'm just afraid we're gonna we're gonna lose it. So the more opportunities you guys get to interview more people that were part of it, as we, we mentioned earlier, get maybe get Bob Seek and Charlie Mars and some of the guys that were here while while we were doing this in Houston, they were doing this in KSC and and training the the launch teams and going through to, to stuff because because one day nobody's going to know what they did or well, how we're they trying did to it. make sure that and god bless you for wanting yeah. to help us to get this out there because uh he's right uh, history has a way in this 21st century of 
of uh, being uh, uh, bent in different ways and forgotten about. And uh, boy, this Artemis generation certainly makes it sound like it's easy, but when you did well, an Apollo mission every three months and we're looking at an Artemis mission after Artemis three, a year every from, two years. Uh, every, if we're lucky in, uh, in there. So, and, and, but I'm and, not gonna get you started on that, sir, yeah, because well, but, but, we'll have another program yeah, with that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but, but this started simple and got to be complex. What, what they're doing today it's starting at 18 orders of complexity <laughs> more more difficult uh -huh. um, starting there yeah I, you know I, I mean it's just it's just i don't know well I mean, we'll, we'll give you a forum to talk about well, that I, we're no, you know, it, i'm not gonna I'm you don't want to get in trouble there, i'm not gonna but, you know i mean but but no your opinions are valid you are like you we know, said you're a respected person in the nasa community yeah. and uh my experience here at the American Space Museum, knowing wonderful people like you from the, the Apollo programs, is that uh, why don't they talk to these people about this? I know problems that Artemis had that they had. They, they finally talked to some shuttle people about it. They were having the same problem. It's just there's no continuity, and that's what an well, outsider well, uh, sees. The, the Apollo fire was caused by wiring that burned. Yeah. One of the people trying to build a replacement for shuttle built a spacecraft with wire that burned. Yes, yes. Today. And I, they still I mean, haven't flown. I, 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 I mean, know. I mean, so somewhere or another, something got Boeing lost. Starliner, okay. Yeah. Well, uh, hey, thank you a lot. Uh, and what a wonderful show. We hope that you all tell your friends to watch it on here. And we're going to have Jay Honeycutt back and uh, doing some little other areas of his career. Uh, and you've been involved in our Shuttle Fest. And we're also working up some ways that you on the Space Coast can enjoy a dinner and an evening with Mr. Honeycutt and some of his friends. So we're going to make that happen. Uh, anything you'd like to say that I haven't asked no, you you'd like no. to share with people up there? No, they probably didn't hear. All right, well, look up there as we tell everybody. <laughs> they probably that, uh, didn't want to hear. We tell everybody how much we love this gentleman, as well as we value what he shares with us, uh, wanting to share with the whole world these lessons learned from Apollo today, uh, apply today. So, Marty, thank you for a wonderful Stream Streamlabs presentation there. If you were watching this, we will look at your comments because it's recorded. And I'll make sure that your question is answered by Mr. Honeycutt. So until then, until next time we have you on here, sir, thank you so much. Awesome job, and I learned so much. Until the next time, I'm Mark Marquette saying we cannot see, we can't wait to see you in our museum to bridge the space between us.